overview um, as to uh, the book of uh, Pilgrim's Progress and what it does. And uh, hopefully we'll also listen to a song, a hymn that John Bunyan wrote that encourages people on their pilgrim pathway. Okay, so we'll see. We'll see if we can make all this work and see if we can make it flow uh, here in a virtual format. So we'll pray. Let's pray. Ask God's blessing on our time. We'll get started here. Father, thank you for this time. We're grateful. We're asking you that you would use this. Lord, this is not your word. We acknowledge that. But it's a book that has a lot of your word in it. We pray that you would use this book to encourage us, to provoke us to love and good works on our journey to the celestial city. So Lord, bless and lead, guide our time by your spirit's help and presence, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me say a few things here. Um, one of those is that as we, uh, as we do this, what I'm hoping is that this will be Today may not work as well because we're getting started, but I'm hoping that this will be somewhat interactive, like I'm assuming that you'll read the section that's assigned uh, for the week, and then we'll come together, and we can I can say a few things, but I'd love to be have it to be more interactive as we work together uh, on this. Uh, so um, for next time, you should have the sheet that marks out uh, what we're reading. Next week would be week two, which in the um, in the document I sent you is pages 11 through 35. And essentially you're reading the first part up to Goodwill, where it, it title, it's titled Goodwill, the Keeper of the Wicket Gate. So that's the section that you'd read for next time. And so um, as you read that, just think about what you're reading. And if you've got some comments or questions, love to... Uh, love to interact with you over those. Well, let's start by talking about who was this man, uh, John Bunyan. And let me introduce you to him with a PowerPoint. Part of it is mine, and part of it I picked up uh, somewhere several years ago. So John Bunyan lived in the 17th century. You can see the dates of his life here on this uh, on this slide, 1628 to 1688. He died just a few months short of his 60th birthday. He, uh, he wrote, uh, uh, kind of amazing this, he wrote the best-selling book in the English language, second only to the Bible. Uh, his work was translated into about 200 languages, this is a book that Spurgeon, if you remember Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher, it's a book that he read twice a year for 50 years. Spurgeon read Pilgrim's Progress about 100 times. Uh, this book, Pilgrim's Progress, was the one of the greatest allegories written in the English language. So who was this man that put out this, this work? Um, he was a man who was recognized by extremely... Uh, extremely educated believers. John Owen was a theologian. He was a Puritan. You can still read his writings. Um, his writing is not simple, but it is profound and it is blessed uh, to read through his works. And But John Owen, this learned man who had connections even with the royal family in England um, in terms of his, his ability to minister to them or opportunity, uh, made the comment one time, gladly would I give up all my learning for the powers, for the tinker's power of reaching the heart. The tinker refers to John Bunyan, and we'll mention more of that in a little bit. Bunyan was a man of extremely humble origins. Uh, he talks about when he and his first wife <laughs> came together, they didn't have anything. In fact, he says the only dowry that he received was two books. His wife bought, his wife was from a very pious, religious, devout background, and she brought into the marriage two books, two godly books. And he says that's about all she brought into the marriage. They were extremely poor. In fact, we don't even know the name of his first wife. We, we think her name was Mary because their oldest daughter was named Mary, but we don't really know for sure. 
um, what her first name was. He was born in, in Elstow, uh, near Bedford, England. This would be north of London. Some of you have traveled to London. He was the oldest son of a tinker. And uh, what was a tinker? We don't have uh, we don't have too many tinkers left today, I guess, maybe. But um, a tinker, uh, here's a definition, a person who travels from place to place, mending pans, kettles, and other metal utensils as a way of making a living. This is what he, this is what his father did. So by nature of life in those days, as the oldest son, he would have learned the trade uh, from his father. He had a very slight formal education, again, in contrast, in deep contrast to men like John Owen and other preachers of his day. He had very, very little formal education. He was a lover of music, but would not have had any money, uh, really, in his early days, at least, would not have any money to buy instruments. So what did he do? Well, he used his tinker skills to make an iron violin, if you can imagine, and uh, took a leg of a stool and made it into a flute and uh, loved music and improvised to come up with instruments that that he could play. Um, he was married twice. His uh, first wife, again, we're not sure of uh, her name. They had four children and she passed away. Then um, he, ma he married somebody named Elizabeth and um, she was significantly younger than he was. And uh, they had two children. And so all in all, two children that lived, I should, I should say. And uh, so all in all, they uh, brought up six children uh, together between them. He was a man, not only of humble origins, he was a man of a tortured uh, conscience. And this relates to his salvation. He really struggled for assurance of salvation. Um, he uh, talks about how as a younger man, he was all the vices of his day. He was involved in those. He had been a soldier. He had opportunities. Uh, uh, being a soldier kind of absorbed the atmosphere that came with that. Um, but God was at work in his heart, and he comes under real conviction, especially he heard a sermon on the Lord's Day, and uh, he would be out playing on the Lord's Day, and in those days, the Lord's Day was kept very strictly on Sunday, and he came under real conviction, and the Lord used that to begin working in his heart. It was like the Lord was saying to him, are you, are you going to keep doing this and go to hell, or are you going to... Are you going to get yourself right with God? And the Lord began to use that in his life. And he actually wrote a book uh, called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Some of you may have read that. It's a good book. Uh, it's, an auto, it's his autobiography. And in that book, it, it, he talks about the struggles he had to come to assurance of salvation. He was greatly influenced by, the, by a man who was a pastor there in Bedford of the Baptist Church name was John Gifford. He was sometimes called Holy Gifford. Uh, Gifford had been converted about 1650, and um, he becomes the preacher, the human instrument through whom uh, Bunyan uh, begins to grow in his Christian life, uh, is converted partly, again, through sermons, partly through reading, um, and so on. And uh, Bunyan is converted and baptized and joins the church in 1653. He during the time, just to give you a little bit of idea, what was happening in this time period uh, in England? And we're, we're all a product of our times. And um, John Bunyan, in his, during this time period, was really was a troubled time in England. Um, England uh, has a monarchy, as we're aware even till today, has a parliament. And in theory, the king and parliament share power, in theory, right? This is how it how it's supposed to work. Uh, today, of course, the, the king or the queen is largely a figurehead with very little actual power. But they're supposed to work together, at least in, in former days. King James I, okay, this would be the king who authorized the King James Version. Okay, King James I was a little power hungry, and he did not work well with parliament. And in fact, when his son, King Charles I, came to the throne, he tried to rule without parliament. He offended the Puritans. He was just a little bit Roman Catholic, which didn't set well in England. 
And uh, eventually he was forced to get help from parliament. They raised an army. They started a civil war. And Charles I, the king of England, was eventually beheaded. And they got rid of their king. This is during the lifetime, the early years of John Bunyan, is what we're saying. And they had a government called the Commonwealth. And again, this is during this time. So, for example, Bunyan was a soldier in that civil war. He talks about a time when his feels like his life was providentially spared. He was supposed to go out and stand guard during a siege. Another soldier took his place during that time. That soldier was shot in the head and died. And Bunyan sees in this God's providence in protecting his life. Um, you may have heard the name Oliver Cromwell. Okay, this is the time period of Oliver Cromwell, probably a Christian, okay, a godly man who feared the Lord, probably a believer. Um, and uh, he became the Lord protector of this of this protectorate, this commonwealth time period when there was not a monarchy. Um, this is the time of Bunyan's conversion. Um, uh, eventually, when Cromwell died, his son reigned, or no, that's not the right word, reigned, but came to leadership after him. Uh, things didn't go well. Things began to falter. England wanted its king back. They brought back to the throne Charles II. And uh, as you can imagine, Charles II was not a great friend of the Puritans or nonconformist Christianity. I mean, think of what they did to his father, for example, Charles I. And so um, he came uh, to the throne and brought in a time period of persecution for people like John Bunyan. And uh, during his time, they published these three acts of non-toleration. Now, what do we mean by non-toleration? Okay, so Bunyan, we would say of Bunyan, he was a non-conformist. Okay, what's a non-conformist? Well, a non-conformist is somebody who does not conform to the Anglican Church or to the Church of England. And so there was this act called the Act of Uniformity. Okay, so this was where you had to conform to the Anglican Church, or probably a better term is the Church of England. So you had to conform uh, to this, to the church, to its, its pattern of worship, especially to the Book of Common Prayer, which laid out the rituals and rites of the Church of England. So if you were not willing to do this, you were a nonconformist. Well, Bunyan is a Baptist. He's a nonconformist. Um, in addition, you had this conventicles act, okay? Conventicles is an old English word for like a meeting, a gathering. Um, they did not want people gathering. Uh, they were concerned about political uprisings and they were concerned about the power of preachers to sway the multitudes. And so they said, okay, you, uh, you can't have a religious meeting of more than uh, five persons that are not family members. Well, that actually was what got Bunyan in trouble. He would gather with people, he'd gather together, and he was the preacher. And then there was this five mile act where they just kept making rules because pastors found ways to avoid <laughs> nonconformist pastors found ways to get around the rules. So they would make a new rule. Here was one. OK, the five mile act. OK, so um, you could not live within eight kilometers of a parish from which you'd been expelled. Uh, by the way, another name associated with this time is Matthew Henry, okay, or especially Philip Henry, his father. Matthew Henry's father, the commentator, his, his father, Philip Henry, was expelled from his church because he was a nonconformist, and Philip Henry turned his energies, since he didn't have a church, Philip Henry turned his energies to raising his son, Matthew Henry, and oh, how we have benefited as a result of that. So all of this is within the time of John Bunyan, okay? He's not an Anglican. He's not a Church of England man. He's a nonconformist Baptist. And this is how he gets himself into uh, trouble. Uh, eventually, there is the Declaration of Indulgence, 1672. This is when Bunyan is freed from, from prison. He goes back to prison a few years later. But ultimately, uh, uh, freedom began to come into the country of England at that time and freed Bunyan to do more of his uh, preaching. 
So Bunyan, because of his convictions as a nonconformist and as a preacher, ends up in prison for about 12 years. And it was during this imprisonment that he begins to work on this book, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, as well as other books. Pilgrim's Progress was not the first book that he wrote. He actually ended up writing about 60 books. Here's a man with very little formal education. Um, he begins to preach. Again, he he doesn't have a <laughs> he doesn't have a, a a formal educated background. He is people like him because he talks like they do. Uh, he he uses the common language. Uh, you may not feel that way when you read Pilgrim's Progress. You may feel like this this guy writes in this you know old English and who, who can understand it? But uh, this is how in his day this was the common language, and so he had a power with the common man because of the way he talked. He spoke to their hearts. Um, he eventually was was arrested in November of 1660. Uh, he was put in prison. He was put in prison for a period of six months uh, initially. And the idea was that after six months, he, um, this says three months, I've also read six months, but um, he, uh, he, was, he was put in prison. And um, they were going to let him go three to six months later, if he would agree not to preach again. All he had to do was say, I won't preach. And they would have let him go. But he felt constrained by God. He had to preach. And so his comment was, if you let me out today, I'll preach tomorrow. And so because of that, uh, he ended up spending 12 years in prison. There are some that think that maybe his time in prison actually may have spared his life. It is possible that he would have either uh, he would have been executed. He could have been shipped out of the country and told not to come back on pain of death. So it could be even that the Lord used this to, to spare his life. But it was a very tough time for him. I mean, he is the breadwinner for his family. He doesn't, he's not a landed, he's not one of these people with all kinds of properties and lands and estates and money coming in. He earns his living by, you know, a little bit by his preaching. He earns his living by being a tinker, by mending pots and pans. So his family, he gets thrown in prison. His family largely lives on the charity, on charity from the people in his church, the Bedford Baptist Church. Um, in addition, he, he makes shoelaces. If you can imagine, he makes shoelaces while he's in prison. Um, especially challenging to him was he had this blind daughter named Mary. And so he felt like he was bringing a house down upon his family. This is a comment um, from him. He felt that he was a man who was pulling down his house upon the head of his wife and children, yet he knew he was right and wrote over and over again, I must do it. I mean, if you can, I mean, it's hard to put ourselves in his position, but imagine you've got, you know, he's got, you've got four children. He's got two more. One will be born um, a few years later than the second one so of, the, of, the, of the second marriage. Um, he, you know, he, he's torn by his conscience, but he has to preach. He feels so strongly that he has to preach that he will not say, say he will not say to them, I won't preach. Um, and he feels like he's pulling his house down. Um, he, um, during the time that he's, he's in prison, it's kind of funny, and I don't know all the details of this, but it seems like depending on the jailer, they would sometimes let him out of prison because they knew he would come back. And so there are times when, when you know, he could get permission to go home and he would even preach sometimes. And then, you know, they'd give him a time when he had to come back. Uh, or, or maybe, you know, they, they would know that, okay, here's a time when, when there, there, there will be no inspection of the prison. And so, you know, he could leave and then maybe they would know the inspector was coming and they'd say, okay, John, you better get back in prison because the inspector's coming. You know, and so he'd go, he'd go back into prison again. Um, so it was an interesting arrangement, you know, say so he was in prison. He, he was primarily in prison, but he did have times when uh, they would let him out for a day or I don't even know, maybe a few days, whatever. Um, but it was while he was in prison that he began working on this book, uh, Pilgrim's uh, Progress. 
a um, little bit, just uh, overview. Eventually, he gets out of uh, gets out of jail. He's actually called to be a pastor while he's in in the prison. Um, ends up getting put in prison again a few years later, just for a few months. Um, his book, the first edition of Pilgrim's Progress, comes out in 1678. Um, like I mentioned to you, he wrote more than uh, more than 60 books, and died in 1688. He was writing to London. Um, he heard about a father and son who were in conflict with each other, so he decided to go um, a little different or on his way to London to stop by a place called Reading and stop by there and try to help a father and son uh, reconcile. In the process, it was a heavy rain because he's riding on horseback, right? He, and uh, ends up getting thoroughly wet in this heavy rain. He contracts a fever and uh, ends up uh, dying. Uh, just again, a few months short of his uh, 60th uh, birthday. He's buried in England, Bunhill Fields. I've, I've seen his, uh, uh, his monument there. If you ever get to London, this is worth taking the time to go by and see. Uh, very popular nonconformist cemetery uh, is where he uh, is, is buried. So this book, Pilgrim's Progress, we're about to read, became very influential even in John Bunyan's own lifetime. Uh, the first edition, again, was 1678. Uh, they needed another edition within the first year, 13 editions within his own lifetime. Now think of this, this is within, uh, he's going to die within 10 years of the first edition. So 13 editions, more than one a year, 100,000 copies in England. Okay, that's nothing in our day, but in his day, 100,000 copies in England, an extremely popular book. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Spurgeon read this book over 100 times. Um, there was a day when the average Christian family in, in England or English speaking families, there was a day when they had basically you had three books. You had the Bible, you had Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you had John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Um, this is a book that early missionaries would take with them. They would translate. It would be one of the, uh, after translating the Bible, this would be one of the first books that they would translate. Uh, it was in India by the 1700s. It was in India. It was in Africa by the 1800s. Uh, they had it, uh, again, going to Tahiti, these other places. I'm just saying this is the influence of this book early on. Um, it, it has lost its appeal in some ways in our, the 20th century, 21st century. Christians are not reading this book as much anymore. Um, what's interesting is it's made its way into the literary circles. And now you have uh, secular colleges and universities and their English departments. They are reading Pilgrim's Progress as an example of English literature. And so it, it, it still is being used, but a little differently and not what Bunyan, I think, would have wanted. So just a little bit again. So 1628 is when he's born, the uh, year of crisis, uh, his marriage to a wife from a godly home. He's baptized. Uh, his wife and pastor die, his first wife. Uh, his first book is published. His first imprisonment begins. He's released, licensed, pardoned. He's imprisoned again. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress is published in 1688. Uh, Bunyan dies. So this is a little bit of the background behind this man, uh, John Bunyan. Anybody have a question or comment they'd like to make here before we transition a little bit? Anybody have a, a thought that you'd like to share with us or something that you think might be of help? Or um, well, Tim, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Go ahead. Brother. Okay. Uh, question. So each each edition. So a definition of an, an edition doesn't necessarily mean that each edition is uh, is uh, modified or changed in its writing. It's just the fact that there's a certain quantity that was published, and that's called the first edition. And then when that's all run out and sold, it then it becomes a second edition. But sometimes there were changes made to each one of the editions. Okay. Yeah. Is that correct? 
I, I think so. Exactly. Like, you know, you would, you would have a rata. So you would have mistakes. And so they go in and fix a mistake might be some little changes. I know one time there was a picture that they wanted to put in, but they had the wrong name on the city in the back end of the picture. So they had to wait till like the third edition to put it in. So exactly. It's not like, it's not like he was changing it. Um, you know, you'd have some, you know, errors, typographical errors, you know, whatever. So exactly, okay. exactly. All right, thanks. So as a publisher, you wouldn't want to put out more copies than you thought would sell, you know, so uh, too. So they would, you know, there was limitations like that. So good point. All right, thank you. Sure. Any other comments or questions as we think about this? Think about this book here. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm going to assume that um, you had a chance to read his apology on the front of his book, and we're, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But let me just let me talk to us a little bit about what we're going to find in this book. Okay, and maybe it would help us if I put up a whiteboard here uh, so we can uh, see this, and I can I can talk through this a little bit here. Um, as we think about this book, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, okay, what we're reading about, it, it's actually, it's, it's an allegory. And we're going to see in a minute that this is part of why he wrote his apology to the book. Because allegory was not, you know, you don't, do, should you write a religious book in the form of fiction? <laughs> so, you know, this is some called it one of the first fiction, you know, Christian fiction books. And is fiction a legitimate uh, way to to write a book, a Christian book. This was a question in his day. Um, it he's writing this book, and it's the story of a man. His original name, by the way, was Graceless. Okay, Graceless. We know him in the book as Christian, but before he's Christian, he's Graceless. Sure, we can all see the religious connotations right behind that. And in Pilgrim's Progress, we are following Graceless or Christian on a journey. We're following him on his journey as a pilgrim. Okay, what is a pilgrim? Okay, a best definition I heard one of my pastors, Pastor Mark Menick, actually used to say it this way a pilgrim is a person who's living for another place and another time. That's a pilgrim, a person who's living for another place and another time. We are all pilgrims. We are living for another place and another time. And of course, Hebrews 11 provides a biblical background behind this idea of a pilgrim. People like Abraham, they're looking for a city. Abraham is not looking for property in the land of Canaan. He lives in tents. All he has when he dies is a place to bury his wife. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. That's where he's headed. That's where his, eye, that's where his eyes are focused. That's a pilgrim. A pilgrim lives, lives by faith and that which is unseen and that which is future. So um, graceless Christian is, is we're watching the progress of a pilgrim. Okay, so the pilgrim's progress, a pilgrim's progress, and he's traveling from, okay, anybody may have picked this up already, he's traveling from the city of destruction, that's his home city, the city of destruction, and he's traveling to the celestial city, and of course, as he journeys from the city of destruction to the celestial city, he has many, many experiences. And in those experiences are people. And as you read Pilgrim's Progress, you're going to come across all these different names of people. Okay, I, I would like, I don't know if I'll ever get around to doing this, but I would like to go through it and count how many different people are mentioned by name. I'm guessing there are about 70 different people mentioned by name in Pilgrim's Progress Part 1, 
Okay, there's actually a part two that's about his wife, Christiana, and her journey to the celestial city. But in part one, I'm guessing there's about, um, I'm, again, this is a rough estimate, would be about 70 named individuals. I would say about 40 to 50 of those would be what we could call maybe key character would be too strong of a word, but about 40 or 50 would be people who actually factor into the story. And all of their names have meaning. Okay, so for example, one of the first people that we will uh, meet in the book Pilgrim's Progress is we'll meet a man by the name of Evangelist. Okay, uh, we will meet a man by the name of Help. Um, we will meet a man by the name of Goodwill. Um, we will meet some neighbors some fellow uh, citizens of the city of destruction uh, by the name of pliable and obstinate. You can see that each one of these names has, has meaning. Uh, there's a person um, as well uh, by the name of pagan later in the story. There's a person by the name of Pope in the story. Uh, we have somebody named atheist in the story. Um, a very ca colorful character later on is a man named Talkative. Um, we have a man named Ignorance, who really is the focus as the, pil as the book Pilgrim's Progress ends. It's like the final spotlight as the book comes to a close is on this man, Ignorance. Um, and uh, as he is ferried over the river of death and tries to make his entrance into the celestial city. So as you read this book, you want to keep an eye on these different people and, um, and, and learn from them. And in the edition of Pilgrim's Progress that I, I, I passed around, or Brother Yuchai passed around, uh, it, in this edition of Pilgrim's Progress, there's a lot of scripture and uh, what he's doing is he's trying to fill us in on the uh, on the the, the scriptural background uh, behind these different people. So it's this fascinating story uh, that we have in this uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Okay, any any comments, thoughts about that? I'm just trying to get us started a little bit, and I want to turn our attention uh, to um, to the actual uh, to his apology here for just a, a few minutes here. But any. Any thoughts or comments or uh, questions here as we uh, transition? Just, to that? Uh, one quick comment here, uh, Brother Tim. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, is that as a Christian, as a Christian, we meet these many of these people <laughs> in our daily walk? Yes, <laughs> exactly. We, we thought these people were dead. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Or we thought it was just an allegory, right? It's just fiction. Yep. Um, exactly. I mean, that's the point of this book. And, and Bunyan's going to talk about this in his apology to the book. He's basically is, I'm, this is a way of helping you understand truth. Um, we meet with atheists. Uh, we meet with obstinate. We meet with pliable. Uh, we meet with evangelists. That's how many of us came to Christ. Uh, so exactly, it, it it really is. It's neat as you meet these different uh, people. So is the book trying to teach us how our response should be when we when we meet with these people? Um, I I think so. And part of it is yeah. I mean it it, it gives us an idea how to respond. Um, it it gives us an idea of the kind of people we meet. It also warns us to not be those kind of people is also partly what he's doing. Um, so he's sifting out real religion from fake, real Christianity from fake Christianity. That's also a part of what he's doing. Yeah, real good, real good comment there. Okay. All right, let me take just a minute. And if you've got a copy there, uh, if you can look on your, Maybe your gadget. I, maybe I won't share this. I don't know. Maybe I should. I'll, maybe I'll change my mind here. But this would be page five in our um, and and if you if you, you don't have to have this copy. So I tried to 
give us the, you know, the, the, the parameters, the subtitles, but this is the author's apology for his book. Okay. How, did anybody read this? How did you like his poem? <laughs> okay. So this is his, so he's not a poet. Okay. You got to realize this guy has very little formal education. So his rhymes are not necessarily at the end of a sentence. Okay. So, um, you know, so it's a really rough rhyme. I think we'd call it dog roll or something like that, you know, in English in terms of the quality of his poetry, but this is his defense for writing his book because he did get some flack for writing for writing Pilgrim's Progress. Again, in his day, um, should you use allegory? Should you write fiction? Is that spiritual? Would the Holy Spirit ever use something like this? And so, you know, he had to overcome some objections to his style of, of writing. Um, so he, um, and, and, and the edition I gave you, okay, I'm not sure why it's this way, but you have to read uh, the first column all the way through like four or five pages. Then you go back up and you read the second column all the way to the end. Okay, so I, I tried to mention that to you so you don't get lost in it. Let me just, let me read a little bit of this. Okay, just to give you an idea, okay, of his apology and help us think through this. Okay, so I'm gonna start at the beginning, uh, very first paragraph of his apology. When at the first, I took my pen in hand, thus for to write, I did not understand that I at all should make a little book in such a mode. No, I had undertook. <laughs> yeah, you really have to love the way he rhymes, right? I had undertook to make another, which when almost done, before I was aware, I this begun. In other words, he's writing a different book. Um, I think people speculate that may, may have been something like the Heavenly Footman. He had this uh, book called something like the Heavenly uh, Footman that he was uh, working on. And uh, I think I think the thought is that that was the book that he was uh, he was he was working on at that at that time. And thus it was. So what he's saying essentially is he didn't really plan to write Pilgrim's Progress. He was writing a different book. All of a sudden he got these ideas in his mind. And so he, you know, anyway, and thus it was, I, I'm reading again. And thus it was, I, writing of the way and race of saints in this our gospel day, fell suddenly into an allegory about their journey and the way to glory. In more than 20 things, which I set down, Okay, so about 20 ideas came to his mind. This done, I 20 more had in my crown. Okay, and of course, this is an older idea for your head, right, your brain. In more than 20 things which I set down, this done, I 20 more had in my crown. And they again began to multiply, like sparks that from the coals of fire do fly. No, then thought I, if, if that you breed so fast, I'll put you by yourselves, lest you at last should prove ad infinitum and eat out the book that I had that I already am about. And he's like, no, 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 stop. Okay, if if you keep multiplying in my head, I'm gonna quit working on my other book. Is, is what he is what he's saying. Well, so I did, but yet I did not think to show to all the world my pen and ink in such a mode. Okay, he never in, they didn't intend this. I only thought to make I knew not what. Nor did I undertake, thereby to please my neighbor, no, not I, I did it mine own self to gratify. Neither did I but vacant seasons spend in this my scribble, nor did I intend but to divert myself in doing this from worser thoughts which make me do amiss. Okay, so he basically saying, listen, I, you know, I did this personally. I thought I would enjoy this. I thought it would help me. Um, he's saying, I thought it would help me with my thoughts. Um, Got to realize that he's in prison. He has lots of time on his hands, lots of time to think. And the more he thinks, I mean, thinking is an idle mind is not good. He's worried about his family. Um, he's got other spiritual burdens. So this was a way to keep his mind occupied from thinking about his worries or his other concerns. So he's doing this uh, personally. I'll keep reading. Thus I set pen to paper with delight and quickly had my thoughts in black and white. For having now my method by the end, meaning by the tail, so he had kind of figured out what he was going to do, still as I pulled, it came. It just, it just kept coming and coming. And so I pinned it down until it came at last to be for length and breadth the size which you see. 
Well, when I had thus put my ends together, I showed them others that I might see whether they would condemn them or them justify. Okay, so he shows it to other people. And some said, let them live. Some, let them die. Some said, John, print it. Others said, not so. Some said, it might do good. Others said, no. Now was I in a strait and did not see which was the best thing to be done by me. At last I thought, since you are thus divided, I print it well, and so the case decided. For thought I, some I see would have it done, though others in that channel do not run, to prove then who advised for the best, thus I thought fit to put it to the test. <laughs> so the idea, so some people said yes, some people said no. So what to do? Well, why don't we print it and see what happens? And that will be the test. Well, aren't we glad that Mr. John Bunyan uh, ended up uh, publishing this book and we have been enjoying this book, Christians have for, uh, for many, many a day. So we can be really thankful for how the Lord has uh, used, uh, used this man. Any, any, so I'm just going to stop there with his apology. Any, any questions or thoughts? Um, I, uh, just to be honest, I don't understand everything in that apology. <laughs> so, so there are some allusions he makes to things in his day. And uh, so I don't have it all figured out, but uh, I think you can get the idea of, of what he's saying um, from from some of the comments there, but any, any quick, thoughts, quick comments? Quick question here, Jim. Yes, sir. The, um, okay, so generally, how would, uh, how were all of his works uh, physically protected? Now we know God was protecting things, but how were they protected physically? And how was he able to get all of these works out of prison without a guard, uh, maybe confiscating some, destroying some and so forth? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know all the details. Um, he, you know, he did have a little bit of freedom. So he was allowed to have books and things there in, in prison. They would give him writing materials. Um, he was prevented from preaching. He evidently wasn't prevented from writing. Uh, he, he um, as far as how it was, it doesn't seem like his writings were in any way confiscated. Um, it doesn't seem like that was a major issue. Um, I, I've read, I don't have handy, my, my big volume of John Bunyan's biography by John Brown, which is a classic, is, is in the Philippines. And so I, I don't have access to that. Um, so I, I don't know if, there, if that was a, a, a problem or not. I, I'm assuming that publishers, you know, they were looking at things that would make money like in any day. And so, you know, if they got something that they thought they could print that would make money, you know, they were willing to do it. So I, that's a good question. I don't know all the answers to that. So thank you. It's a valid question. Okay, good. Any other? Okay, let me do one other thing. I think you'll be able to hear this. What I want to do is I want to play um, this song that Bunyan wrote. Okay, but before I do that, let me just show you the words to this, and I'll put the PowerPoint screen back up again. This is a song that Bunyan wrote, okay, a, a hymn, and uh, when I was in graduate school and seminary, we would sing this in church sometimes, and it's called He Who Would Valiant Be, and the idea is whoever would, whoever is willing to be valiant or courageous let him go on a pilgrimage. And the idea is that being a pilgrim requires courage. And I think that's a good message for us today to remember, that even in our day, being a pilgrim, being a Christian requires courage. You may feel, and maybe increasingly in our world, you may feel like you are in the minority. The truth is you probably are in the minority. Um, and what we need is courage. And that's what this song is about. He who would valiant be against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. 
there's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Yes, there'll be difficulties, um, but he's not going to stop just because of difficulties. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves confound his strength the more. It's meaning the more, they, the more they try to scare him, they end up only confounding themselves. He's going to gain more strength. He's not going to quit. No foe shall stay his might. Though he would giants fight, he will make good his right to be a pilgrim. He's not going to quit. Since, Lord, thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies flee away. I'll fear not what men say. I'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. Okay, this is the spirit behind this song he who would valiant be. Let me try to play this for us and we'll, we'll, end with, uh, we'll end with this here. That is John Bunyan's pilgrim song, He Who Would Valiant Be, or She Who Would Valiant Be. So may God help us in our pilgrim journey. So I'm going to end there. Any final comments, questions? And you've got the reading for next week. See if you can read it. And we'll have a little more interaction, hopefully, next time. And uh, as we plunge into The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. All right, thank you, Dr. Barry, for the very interesting, insightful, and uh, interesting sharing. Uh, we enjoyed the sharing so much today. Uh, I just want to uh, make an announcement that uh, next week, the timing is 7.30. So if you can, uh, come punctually at 7.30 so that you don't miss the sharing. All right, uh, Dr. Barry, can you close with a word of prayer and we shall sure. end the session. Sure, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time again. And Lord, would you give each of us courage to be a pilgrim in our day and age? We need, we need strength in our inner man that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. So Lord, would you grant each of us what we need? Give us wisdom, discernment. Give us joy, love, 
And again, the courage we need as we make our journey to the celestial city. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. See you all. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Goodbye.